Melbourne, Australia's fastest growing city with its sprawling suburbs of three million people. The capital of Victoria is located on the southern tip of the mainland. Just an hour's drive away on the Mornington Peninsula, the township of Hastings lies on Western Port Bay, an area of immense ecological value. Hastings was once a quiet fishing village, but since the 1960s it's been promoted as a major port and industrial location and as a recreational centre. One of the town's 6,000 residents is artist Ian Cumming. He is the creative force behind a new community approach to environmental awareness. The Seagrass Project was a context for me to work as a puppeteer in a way I've never worked before and to make puppets that relate directly to this environment. My father mentioned the seagrass being a vital issue here uh, in that there had been great losses in the bay and uh, I remembered snorkelling and drifting over the seagrass and looking down on it as though it's a forest just full of creatures with fish and uh, it started to wake in me a feeling for this life that we see nothing of when we're driving through the main street. Ian had worked for 10 years in puppetry and community theatre. He wanted to use his skills to bring Western Port Bay back into the heart of a community whose demands threaten its survival. He was inspired by images which lay buried among childhood memories. Western Port Bay, a recreation area with a small fishing industry. Several quiet holiday towns, beaches, surfing, wildlife preserves, and the world-famous seals and penguins. Suddenly, Western Port is changing. Industries are being established, with 30 ships arriving each week. Thus began the struggle over one of the world's unique coastal wetlands. Protected by two islands, Western Port Bay has deep channels which disperse to shallow waters and extensive tidal mudflats in its northern reaches. The slow-moving, nutrient-rich waters of the bay nurture a remarkably diverse ecosystem. Australia's southern oceans depend on this bay because it functions as a nursery for much of the region's marine life. Every year, Hastings has a community festival. This event was to provide a focus for Ian's work. I wanted to tap into the sense of celebration as a focus to get people working together. Not just as a one-off event, but as a longer-term offering to the life of the town. Ian's father has campaigned for many years against uncontrolled development. He was an industrial scientist and now runs a local nursery. Well, somewhere around the end of the 60s, the people who were living around Western Port and holidaying around Western Port came to be very worried about the pressure that was starting to be imposed by industrial and port development. Oil had been discovered in Bass Strait and it was becoming a major oil port and there was political pressure to bring more industry to Western Port. Western Port Bay is one of the best three natural harbours in the Southern Hemisphere. With these advantages, it is one of the best sites for basic industrial development in the world. Ken Smith has long been an advocate for development. A former Hastings councillor, he is now a member of state parliament. I believe that Western Port Bay, and firstly should be said that it's the best deep water port in southern Australia. 
and it's something that we should be, as, as Victorians and Australians, looking at being able to use. Now, it's also been described as being a fragile port and a fragile bay as far as the environment is concerned, and that very well may be true. But I believe that what we have with the deep water uh, and the availability of safe moorings, that we should be using it more. Twenty years ago, Peter Bridgewater worked as a botanist among the salt marshes of the bay. Today, he is the director of Australian National Parks and Wildlife Service. I suspect that if we were back at the beginning of the 70s now, considering the development of Western Port Bay for industry, uh, we would be saying, look, this is crazy. There must be other places where we can do this. In order to bring the bay out onto the land so that people could see it in a new way, I needed to understand more about the ecology of the area myself. One thing I did was to go to French Island to visit Chris Chandler. Yeah, they're friendly, aren't they? So this green stuff we've got over here is salt marsh, which is normally found in the temperate parts of the world. And then behind it you get mangroves, and uh, mangroves are normally found in the tropics. But the interesting thing about Western Port is the only place in the world where you get salt marshes next to mangroves is in southeastern Australia. So are these mangroves the same mangroves that you'd find in Cairns? Well, very similar. They are a tropical species. And the largest area of mangroves so far south in the world is, is in Western Port the largest concentration of them. If we go over, we can have a closer look at them. Well, if you see the sand here, this is sand that's come out of a channel and it's been brought up by dredging, and it invades over the mud. These tubes here are the breathing tubes from the roots of the mangroves. And when the sand covers them over, it actually smothers the mangroves and they die. And if you look over here a bit further, you'll see those black marks in the mud are actually stumps of old mangroves that were cut by the early settlers to allow them into the foreshore. And as the mangroves have been cut, that's allowed silt into this area, which has covered up the roots of the mangroves and they've died off. And the other thing that happened at the turn of the century was one of the largest swamps in Victoria, the Up Swamp, used to have a lot of silt settling in the swamp. When that was drained at the turn of the century, that silt has now come into the bay. I think that eventually in the long term, we won't see any mangroves along this west coast of French Island at all. The race for industrial development took off in the late 60s, spurred on by the state government. There was talk of an international airport and dreams of nuclear power. A scheme was devised to fill in large parts of the bay for port facilities and heavy industry. The plans provoked strong local protests, which grew into a statewide campaign to save the bay. One of the important outcomes of, of that environmental movement which started in the early 70s was the uh, uh, institution by the government of a, of a major environmental study involving a, a large number of people and several million dollars expenditure and a great output of reports um, basically all of which said that the bay is a very special place and it's a very sensitive place to man's pressures. The Western Port study described a complex cold water system and wide range of habitats leading to an unusual diversity of species. It concluded that development could be dangerous and such plans needed careful assessment. The grander schemes for Western Port fell by the wayside. I believe that the study that was done was very important. It made people realise what was available down on the peninsula that should be preserved. And certainly I don't have any problems with the preservation of the Mornington Peninsula as long as development can occur. And during the heady pro-development days of the 70s, there'd been substantial confrontation and a great deal of involvement. But as the 80s wore on, people got a little tired and we felt that there was a need for a fresh approach. Uh, other than confrontation, to raise people's awareness. Ian's suggestion of the foreshore as a location for this new approach has a symbolic connection for his father. Well, uh, this all used to be mangroves and salt marsh, a vital part of the bay, yeah. until it was decided to make it the town tip. And for many, many years, rubbish was dumped here, 
and then yeah. finally a, a park well, was built on top of I it. I actually remember coming down with a trailer load of rubbish at some stage, probably further down, and dumping yeah, well, your poisons are probably leaking out of the <laughs> bay. Well, they were our poison, it wasn't just my poisons. <laughs> well, I think it's a tremendous sight, and where would the people be? Um, well, in a horseshoe around... The show's around theme is to be seagrass, the subject of an uh, environmental yeah, scare which began in the early 80s. Yeah, maybe, yeah. The Western Port study had identified seagrass as the primary source of food production in the bay's ecosystem. Further investigation revealed that in just 10 years, 80% of the lush seagrass meadows had vanished. Increased silting and turbidity of the water due to human activity were among the suspected causes of this potentially disastrous situation. But scientists were unable to prove the link. We're going to do this show tonight and we're going to show this audience the best thing that's ever come to Hastings. The project needs more than Ian's enthusiasm and skills. Open my eyes. He's gathered a team of professional artists from Melbourne to work with local groups. I think the first thing that you observe is that people are a bit bewildered <laughs> about what might happen. And then the excitement gradually grows as the idea cottons on, you know, as people realise, as they see things starting to be built. The weather conditions aren't Ian is planning uh, three shows, one each year for three years. So this is the first step. And by the time they get to the third step, the third show, um, almost anything is possible, I think. The seagrass event creates a myth-like story which draws attention to the dangers of human pressures on the bay. The star is a gigantic crab which Ian has created. The hermit crab depends on the seagrass as do many other creatures. It lives in a shell that once it grows it must discard. And once it's discarded its shell it's vulnerable to attack. The hermit crab is also provides us with a way to understand the community and the change that's coming with people's awareness to their environment. Uh, letting old attitudes go and moving on to a new way of behaving in relation to the environment. The show is a great success, but behind the enthusiasm lies the knowledge that there is no simple solution to the problems facing the bay. It's very hard to say that there's a single greatest threat because it, it's, it's the, the problem of many pressures. One decent oil spill would be absolutely disastrous, but the gradual creeping up of too much pressure of, of lots of little boats could be equally disastrous and the gradual eroding away of the shoreline with installations of marinas or, or other developments or even things inside the shoreline. And so I suppose the greatest threat is a lack of sensitive, properly informed planning. I believe that the conservationists have caused us a lot of trouble, not only in the industrial area, but they've also caused problems as far as the development of recreational facilities. It took a long time for the marina, which is a great asset to the foreshore in Hastings, to allow it to be able to be developed. The problem is that we can't just build a brick wall from one side of the peninsula to the other and say nothing is going to happen here. Urban dwellers like to live by open water. They like to have access for their boats, they like beaches. They don't like salt marshes and mangroves because they produce mosquitoes. And generally, people prefer to have them filled in uh, and used for what they would consider a better recreational source, hanging the environmental consequences. The 
issues are in fact larger than just Western Port Bay. The same sort of thing is happening all around the world. The same pressures are happening on similar coastlines and bodies of water. And what we realise is that all of these are pressures on the total global ecosystem. Imagine life on the globe as, as one organism and that it all interacts together and that there are some parts of it that are, that are virtually the lungs of that organism. And we know the rainforests are in that category. They're very precious. So are the wetlands. And Western Port, with its tides moving in and out and its very shallow water, is a wetland which is just as productive as any rainforest. As planning begins for the second seagrass event, Ian seeks a new symbol for the wetlands environment. In order for people to make a visual connection with what's happening under the water, I'm looking for one of the creatures above the water that depends on that food chain. Yeah, probably the birds are the most obvious. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of black swans, and, uh, of which Western Port has about 14,000, 10 to 14,000. In fact, Western Port has been recognised as a wetland of international importance because of the birds. It has a very large number of swans and other Australian birds, but it's also an important area for birds that come from the northern part of the Soviet Union in Siberia where they breed. 30 species of small waders come down each Australian <coughs> summer through Japan, the Philippines to Australia. So I'm looking for um, a bird, more information really, about uh, some of the birds that live locally. That... Yeah, I really think um, you couldn't go much better than the spoonbill because it's a very visible bird. Um, it's quite a handsome bird and it's, it breeds locally, it depends on areas in southeast of Australia, like Western Port where it breeds in the freshwater swamps and goes out onto the mudflats uh, to feed at low tide. I think that would be quite a good one to use. Ian's backyard is one location in Hastings where groups drawn from the local community gather to work on the new show. Ian is to work with students from Hastings High School. Their task? To bring to life these giant spoonbill puppets. Oh my god! Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. We'll need more than two yeah, support. Ian, I think that one shot it's of doing head for oh, bit. Yeah. Like it's pretty heavy but it's <laughs> worth it. Like. Yeah, Okay. That's it. Now, if you can cue each other, you might say, give yourself a cue, like, down. They start where I start in looking at the spoonbill and the idea of being a spoonbill. So when they pick the puppet up, they start to move the, the bamboo and I might even walk the poles that work the head and the wings with a view to finding a life in the puppet. Down, down. The focus in looking for the life of the spoonbills is to find the essence of the spoonbill rather than to find everything about the spoonbill. Down. Ian has a commitment to this community which is very strong and he sees his ongoing commitment to use the arts and scientists to come together with community people to overcome the devastation that is happening firstly in this community but I think the ripples will be felt hopefully throughout many other communities in Australia. Looking around at everything is absolutely new to you. Yeah, that's a big bird. But then you go to touch maybe its beak. It's important when you do it that you really look at the bird. You really look at the chicks beside you and, and the other mm. things around you, the mud people around you. These mud people really symbolise the, the mud flats that used to be. So when they first come out, they're looking very dried up and injured and the actual birth of the mud child which happens in the spoonbill nest for them symbolizes hope for the future. Rosie Buchanan, whose son is to play the mud child, has got involved with the seagrass project after personal experience with development issues in Hastings. 
Prior to moving to Crib Point, we were assured by the local council that the surrounding government land will be uh, used in such a way to create recreation and tourist facilities. We got a real shock when we actually moved into the area and saw things in the local papers telling us that a giant ammonia urea plant was going to be put on one of the nearby sites. When we realised that it was a strong possibility that the plant being put here without community consultation, we really kicked up a stink and uh, through the efforts of just the local people, we've been able to stop the plant getting into the area. You want to go down? The local council's response was that, oh, this is a bunch of housewives, you know, they don't mean anything, they can't voice their, their opinions and they've got no, no power. And I think we showed them that we certainly do have a lot of power and, and that uh, if we want something done or we don't want anything in the area, we'll certainly let them know very vocally. Sorry, I'm going to move there. like a very expensive uh, way to have a mud treatment. We've been out there putting up the images for Saturday night show and we're doing the third part which is the part when the uh, mud people um, go to the edge of the sea to bring the mud back to life after the human um, destruction of it. And we've created a big image of a sun and there's various pyrotechnic and firework uh, effects which will uh, uh, bring together a sort of an, a, a vision of renewal and rebirth in the in the uh, wetland community. I'll shake this a little bit and see if I can stir any out. Harry Bridle is an educator with What's expert of knowledge of the bay. As part of their preparations, he takes the spoonbill group onto the mudflats. In a sense, what I'm doing is what the spoonbill does. Although this net's not like a spoonbill's bill, that's basically what it does. It races through and sieves and hunts out all these dear little fish. That's the shrimp that our friend eats. Once kids get involved in visiting these places and exploring them, they become aware that they're not mosquito-ridden swamps, they're not horrible places, they're in fact quite exciting places. One of the other things is they find that they're full of living things. This isn't a piece of theatre so much this year as an event and I think because it is to do with the saving of the very environment that we need to live and survive as a human race makes it all the more important for people to, as performers, to feel this strength of going through an act, a positive act, to say what you feel and to put positive directions forward for the future. This wonderful seagrass stuff, it doesn't need a rock to anchor onto. It buries itself in the mud because it's got proper roots. Further out, out to sea there, there's, well, there used to be. The whole northern part of the bay was covered in this stuff. And in the early 70s, about 80% of this stuff just vanished. And a lot of people sort of say, oh, well, why bother? And one of the things they began to notice was that a lot of fish, particularly fish like whiting, started to vanish too. The seagrass meadows provide food and shelter for the marine community. The decomposition of seagrass liberates a wealth of nutrients from the seabed. This is the main food source in the bay and it's vital to creatures such as these. If the seagrass dies, you're removing the main thing. It's like the bottom of a pyramid. Once that goes, everything else goes. Across the front of the nest, the field, go back into a walk and you should find it's a little bit easier with the wind behind us. Okay, so they're speeding through and we're just walking now around to the back. And in behind the nest, you're a little bit interested in the eggs, but you're not... It's hard to imagine the complexity of, of what you're doing in the relation to the bird itself. I mean, you've got to try to make the bird look as realistic as possible. And putting all that together and 
motion is not quite what it seems. You think you take just a bird flying up in the sky and you, you sort of take no notice of it. But once you get behind the bird and try to become a bird as one, it's not as easy as it looks. It's the final day of the Hastings Festival. This year, the Shire Council and the festival organisers are officially supporting the seagrass event. The seagrass event is beginning to make contact with people in the community who have particular offerings to make. There are teachers, there are scientists, there are other artists. What we're aiming to do is, over time, to establish a model in Hastings of how people can work together to understand more of, about where they live. I think it's vitally important now that artists come out of the purpose-built theatre and the exhibition halls and back into society and start to use their talents to uh, express what needs to be expressed in our, in our society. And I think this is all the more important because I think that most people are becoming very consumer-orientated towards entertainment and ritual. The developers' priority is always money first, and I think the trend now these days, particularly through uh, things like the seagrass event and people becoming aware of what's happening around them, is the priority should be on the environment and your quality of life rather than money. And I think that's a trend that's, that's happening very quickly as people are becoming aware that if we don't change our priorities, um, we're going to be in an awful mess. everyone to Seagrass Event 89. <laughs> seagrass event we actually make the seagrass and we make the fish the creatures live in the seagrass and we put ourselves in there as part of the environment so we become in operating a blade of seagrass I'm able to experience the pull of the tide on a blade of seagrass I'm aware of fish swimming past me and feeding and I'm aware of being rooted in the ground, in the mud. So the experience is a phenomenal experience. It's a, an experience of dreaming oneself into the world rather than looking at it from the outside. The performance tells the mythical story of a pair of royal spoonbills and the mud child who hatches in their nest. As the mosquitoes buzz across the mud flats, the birth of the mud child awakens the mud tribe, who've been buried under the rubble of 20th century progress. child to his people. This reconciliation of humanity and nature inspires celebrations out on the mudflats.
200 kilometres from Hastings, a different kind of flame burns. This is Bass Strait. From here, oil and gas are piped to Melbourne via distribution facilities at Hastings and exported through Western Port Bay. Here, tankers mix with ships bringing steel to BHP's huge mill. One of the mill's 1,500 employees is Chris Warwick. He is also the Shire president. The majority of oil into Australia is developed in the Bass Strait oil field. The expected life of that under the current conditions is that it will run out in approximately 1995. That will necessitate bringing in imported products through the Western Port Bay. It's now proposed that it become in the future an even greater oil port and that super tankers, larger tankers than are presently used, should come into the bay, involving deeper dredging and so on, and increasing the hazard. The technology, in fact, has existed for 20 or 30 years for mooring tankers outside in the open ocean and piping the oil ashore from what is known as a single point mooring. It's a very safe and proven technology. Super tankers should certainly use such a, a technology and if they used it then why not get rid of all tankers from the bay? If the oil companies would be prepared to put in lines underneath um, the ocean bed and bring them in, that's fine, but I don't believe that they would be prepared to expend that sort of money. I don't believe it is practical to just ignore the deep water port of Western Port. They can pipe straight into the refinery. There's less opportunity of spills because it's shore-based. The fact that Western Port Bay is lined by these mangroves, which have the aerial roots which supply oxygen to their root systems, means that oil spills just simply coat those aerial roots, oxygen can't get to the plant and it dies. You're not then just in fact faced with dead mangroves, you're faced with the possibility of those mangroves not doing their job, which is to build up sediment, and you have an erosion problem. The industry that exists in Western Port Bay is very mindful of the community's concerns in relation to uh, disasters such as oil spills. There are a number of new measures that have currently been put in place by the SOBHP group to ensure that any oil spills even though they are very minimal, uh, are totally contained within their own areas and not allowed to contaminate the areas of the bay. The ESO facility in Hastings. A valve has failed, spilling oil onto the ground. It's poured down through the Melaleuca fringe and onto the salt marsh killing an area of vegetation. It was just fortunate that it was finally detected and trenches were dug to stop the further progress of the oil uh, and hopefully there will not be significant amounts that will actually reach the mangroves in the sea. But just a few more hours and a few more thousand gallons of, of oil and uh, it would have reached the sea and it would have been a matter of great consequence. Bill, which is small by world standards, is significant for Western Port because it's so confined and because the water moves so slowly in and out. A figure that was quoted in, at the Federal Oil Spills Inquiry was that 50 tonnes spilt in Western Port could have disastrous consequences. Now this spill was 10 tonnes, 10,000 litres. The uh, Exxon Valdez spill was 50 million litres. Uh, in other words, if something like the Exxon Valdez grounding happened in Western Port Bay, the oil would be carried to every part of the bay within, within a few days, would be left on the tidal mudflats and tangled in the mangroves. All of that would be killed and would uh, cause irreversible damage.
rehearsals begin for the final seagrass event. More local people and families have become involved. Again, birds are to be the central image. This time it's the eastern curlew, an endangered species which each year makes its long migration from Siberia to join the resident bird community of the bay. Australia has signed bird protection agreements with China and Japan and is one of over 60 nations in the Ramsar Agreement to protect wetlands. Ramsar is about protecting specific sites. Western Port is one of those and has been nominated on the list. The Chinese and Japanese migratory bird agreements are about protecting particular species, including the eastern curlew. This means that although it's about particular species, the sites such as this one, which they may well wish to use, are also important. One of the problems, I think, is that too few people are aware that Australia has these important agreements uh, and must maintain them. So development must be framed within that principle of wise use of wetlands. And that simply means making sure the wetlands are still here. I believe that there is a need for balance and I've always said there's a need for balance between conservation and development. I believe that most of the developers themselves have addressed some of the problems that they had before. They are now presenting better proposals to councils and to government. They're addressing the problems of the environment, but still the environmental movement continues to be so far to the extreme that they object to everything. The seagrass event has achieved many things, but perhaps the most important in my mind is that it's broken down barriers and created an atmosphere in the community where sensible people can have a say on conservation matters, in contrast to a period where they were threatened if they were greenies. Thanks. See, See you later. later. It's now possible, in fact, for people to have a say in council or in the community about conservation matters without feeling threatened. The wind of change has reached the Shire Council, where an environmental steering committee is being established. The main issue at the moment that we have to talk about is the way that we're going to have community participation. Yeah, well, John, uh, I'm pretty concerned about the expectations that might be raised in the community. This forum should ensure that conservation issues are placed firmly and publicly on the council agenda. If it's to be a community strategy and not a regional one, then we have to have the utmost community participation in all our working groups. And Prue Griffiths is one of five new councillors from the conservation movement. She's about to become the wings of a curlew in the seagrass event. Well, I've done a lot of um, dramatic work in my uh, youth and um, early married stage, but I've not done it for ages, and I did feel a bit of a, a bit of an idiot to start with. And also, no good at craft work at all, and thought I could never do anything like making any such puppet. But I found I did have some skills that I didn't know I hadn't thoroughly enjoyed the hands-on activity in the, in the workshops that Ian Cumming ran with so many wonderful people. It's the day of the final show, a chance to reflect on what's been accomplished. This is my third year of seagrass and I ran for a council after my first year when we were putting in the ammonia urea plant, supposedly down at Bitten. And, uh, and then Rosie joined me and it's just been... I've had a lot, of, lot more interest in community arts and been involved in a lot more and I think it shows we've got possibly six councillors in this year's event and the chief executive. And the chief executive. Yes. Yep. And what would your fellow councillors think if they saw yeah. you I as you are I think most of now? our fellow councillors are going to be in the event, so I think that they've got the same feeling as we have, that they have a, that this is a good way of showing our concern for the environment. Mm. I mean, five o'clock is the death session rehearsal. It might go past six. All through this project has been interesting because all the time you keep going, oh, this is the last time we're going to put that lime out around, you know, mark out the space and last time we're going to do this because it, it's the third year and the last year and uh, but there's sad feelings about that but wonderful feelings because I think uh, really it's needed three years to resolve the story 
in a way, to get it right. And in a way now, I think the story is ready to take to other places. Well, I think the really interesting thing is like arts people who have always had a sympathy for conservation have learnt about the bay um, and about seagrass ecology. And people like myself who've always been involved with wildlife have learned about arts. I mean, I wouldn't have imagined myself getting involved in a theatre event. The people have taken on the, the, the techniques of, of art and are now using it to express themselves as ideas are sophisticated, the presentation is sophisticated in terms of people knowing what theatre is about. So I think um, this is really up to professional standards now in many different ways. By involving ourselves, we are not abdicating, and I think this is one of the vital things for ordinary folk. We, ha we are almost powerless to say something, and through a community event, we can say it powerfully on many levels. It's been exciting to see more and more people becoming involved and the audience growing each year but for me the crucial thing is what happens on an individual level. People have made important small beginnings here in Hastings and I'm sure that the experience of seagrass will live on for a long time to come. Take me with this rubbish 
And let the collier live. The ship pulls away, and on it is the man, with his eyes clearly set and an hourglass in his hand. The wind howls around him, and the waves rebel in ire, rain belting down to quench the raging fire. Fixed far away is a moonbeam on the sea, one last desperate voyage with the curlew circling free. Sunset to dawn rise, moon wags to moon wane, bird lifts its head to sing, life on the wind. <laughs> of the seagrass event is to help all of us connect emotionally with this rare and very beautiful natural environment. And also we want to alert people to the crisis facing this precious wetland which is in our care. So what do we do about it? Do we simply wait for them to do something about it? There isn't a them, the them is us. We have in our backyard an important piece of the globe that we can start doing something about. And that's where we should start and hope that other people are doing likewise or will be infected by our, our feeling about it to do likewise.